Hello and welcome to the session on Lean Six Sigma Greenbelt Improve Fees. This session is driven using Minitab, which is a statistical tool. Even before we proceed with the improve fees, let us understand this equation, which is y is equal to f of x. Output is equal to function of inputs. In the defined phase of Lean Six Sigma Greenbelt, we have looked into what this y is. How to identify the output? We have looked into that. In the measure phase, we have measured what is the current performance of y. Post which we have moved on to the analyze phase in which we have generated a lot of inputs, which ideally impacts the output. Out of that, all the umpteen number of potential inputs, we have shortlisted few inputs which are vital, which are critical, using hypothesis testing and things like that. Now, once we identify what those critical inputs are, which are going to impact the output, now we need to focus on improving those critical or vital inputs. In the improve phase, all we do is focus on improving the critical or vital inputs and if we are going to do that output would automatically improve upon that is the rationale of the improve phase so with that rationale let us get started let us keep moving let me move to the next slide let us understand the course objectives for the improve phase we are going to discuss about the three steps of the improve phase. We are then going to identify all the possible alternate solutions. We are going to discuss about the ideation techniques, brainstorming, the bono six hat thinking, probing, and things like that. We will move on to discuss about benchmarking. There are a lot of benchmarking options available strategic benchmarking, process benchmarking, and things like that. We'll look into all that. And then we will move to the next step of evaluating the generated solutions. Which solution best, best fits me, given my problem and conditions and constraints? As part of that, we are going to discuss about Pew Matrix, Delphi Technique, multi-voting, nominal group technique. All these are the techniques which are used to evaluate the generated solutions. Post which we are going to look into an interesting tool or technique, which is called as design of experiments. We are going to look into benefits, factors, and levels, which would be part of your design of experiments. We'll look into that. After that, we are going to discuss about solution implementation. And then we are going to look into piloting, pre versus post pilot activities. And quickly, we're going to summarize everything in a nutshell, and then we will move on to the control fees. Here we go. These are the three pre votal steps as part of your improve fees. As part of the first step, we are going to identify all the possible alternate solutions. And then we'll move on to evaluate the generated solutions to select the one solution which best suits us. Post which we are going to look into solution implementation. Let us move on and take this forward. So as part of the first step, we are going to identify all the possible alternate solutions. And what are the various techniques which we use? To generate the alternate solutions. First thing is process mapping, within which we have already discussed about cycle time, we have discussed about value added analysis, non value added analysis, which was part of value stream mapping. As part of analyze phase, we have discussed that. In this particular improve phase, we will focus a lot on ideation techniques brainstorming, doing it the round robin fashion, creative thinking with Debono six hat thinking hats, and last is creative thinking by probing. 
post which we are going to discuss about the various benchmarking techniques and we are going to focus a little more on process benchmarking because Six Sigma is all about process, right? So we will focus a lot on process benchmarking. Here comes the first technique which is brainstorming. What is brainstorming? Brainstorming is a structured method of generating unconstrained ideas or solutions, right? It produces umpteen number of ideas, solutions in a relatively short time. It facilitates the creative thinking process. It is then going to separate the idea generation from organizing the ideas. We generate as many ideas as possible in shortest time possible. And then we will have to focus on lateral thinking and vertical thinking, linear thinking and lateral thinking. Linear thinking also means vertical thinking. Linear or vertical thinking is a typical type of approach to problems that involves one being selective, one being analytical and sequential. So sequentially, you'll be very selective and analytical in finding solutions. What about lateral thinking? Lateral thinking is solving problems through an indirect and creative approach. Using reasoning that is not immediately obvious. And you're going to involve ideas that may not be obtainable by using one traditional step-by-step -step logic. Remember, my dear friends, one thing is extremely important in brainstorming. No matter what variant of brainstorming you use, do not ever criticize ideas of any participant. If you criticize one person's idea, the other people are not going to open up. And we know for a fact that the beautiful ideas, the disruptive ideas, often come from those folks who give you out-of-the-box solutions. It is important to avoid the dominance of few of the folks. Few people in your brainstorming might try to dominate the session. It is important to avoid the dominance of such people, right? So, hey, we move on to discuss about brainstorming round robin style, right? What do we do in brainstorming round robin fashion? Hey, here we have an example, right? This is a table, everyone is sitting around and they discuss about the ideas in a round robin fashion. Even before you get started, you will have to clearly state the purpose. What do you want to discuss? What do you want to review? And if at all participants have any doubts, queries around the problem statement, you'll have to review and clarify those. Just give a few minutes for everyone, right, to think about the question at hand. And individually, they will have to write down their own thoughts on a piece of paper. Then gather ideas in a round-robin fashion. Move round the table. Start with this person. Once he answers, move on to the next person. Once he gives you a solution, move on to the next person. So on and so forth. Right? And write down on the flip card so that you do not miss out on any of the ideas that are generated. If suppose any person in this round robin fashion says, hey, I do not have any ideas at this point of time, that is absolutely fine. You can move on. You can skip that person for first time, second time, maybe, right? But don't ever criticize anyone. What would happen is the person who could not speak up about the ideas in the first round, probably upon listening to the other folks speak about the solutions that they are they, they are thinking about, he might open up. He might get new ideas by listening to the other folks. He might get inspired. 
and they're going to build on the ideas of each other. That's the important part of our brainstorming. When the round robin slows down, open the brainstorming session to additional ideas. Say after round one, round two, round three, many people are saying that, hey, we have exhausted, we do not have any more suggestions for you or solutions. That is when you need to open up the further conversation for everyone. Now anyone can throw in an idea. You don't go in the round robin fashion, right? And when the brainstorming has ended, review the list of ideas that were generated until now. Make sure everybody understands each other's ideas. Consolidate all the similar ideas. Probably you can use affinity diagram to do this. Clarify the ideas and ask for more specific information where necessary. Do that. Do not hesitate in clarifying the ideas. All right. Let us discuss about Creative thinking, which is also called as six hat thinking or six thinking hats. Here are the various colors of the hats. Blue, white, yellow, red, black, and green. Right? What is the six hat thinking all about? We are going to do a deep dive on that. But first, let us understand who has developed this technique. Such an interesting technique, isn't it? Right? It's fun to do this, trust me. All right, Dr. Edward Dibunu developed a technique for helping teams stay focused on creative problem solving by avoiding the negativity and group arguments. You get rid of the negativity, you get rid of the group arguments by using Dibunu six hat thinking. This technique is called the six thinking hats. It can be used to enhance the team creativity and evaluate the ideas. This technique can be applied during solutions or idea generation and also can assist in building consensus. You can reach a common conclusion based on consensus. Everyone together agree to a solution. That is consensus. This technique has been used worldwide in a variety of corporations with profound results. Person who wears a white hat has to be neutral and objective. Person who's going to wear a red hat should be emotional and intuitive. A person who wears a black hat should be cautious and careful. Person who wears a yellow hat should speak about hope, positive and speculative thoughts, solutions. Person who wears a green hat is going to focus on creative and lateral thinking. And Blue Hat gives solutions in a controlled and organized manner by thinking in that way. Let us discuss about all these hats in detail now. Here we move on. Here are the various hats. That's the yellow hat. What happens in the yellow? Let us, let us do it the other way around just for now. All right. Yellow hat is for optimism and a positive view of things. When this hat is in use, teams look at the logical benefits of the proposal. And every green hat, every green hat idea deserves some yellow hat attention. What is a green hat then? The green hat makes time and space available for creative thinking. When this green hat is in use, the team is encouraged to use divergent thinking and explore alternative ideas or options, basically. Then we have the blue hat. What is blue hat all about? Blue hat is used for control of the brainstorming process. The blue hat helps teams evaluate the thinking side and determine if it is appropriate or not. This hat allows members to ask for summaries and helps the team progress when it appears to be off track. It is useful for thinking about thinking, right? Thinking about thinking. You think about thoughts, right? That is blue hat all about. 
Let us move on to discuss about the black hat. Black hat thinking calls for caution and critical judgment. Using this hat helps team avoid group think and proposing unrealistic solutions. This hat should be used with caution so that creativity is not stifled. Then we have the red hat. Red hat gives team members the opportunity to present their feelings or intuitive or intuition about the subject without explanation or need for justification. Speak out your feelings. Speak out your intuition. Right? And you need not provide me any justification. Now the red hat helps teams surface conflict and air feelings openly without fear of retribution. There won't be any conflicts here because you need not provide any explanation. You need not provide any justification. Use of this hat encourages risk taking and right brain thinking. We have left brain thinking and right brain thinking. It's right brain thinking, basically. The white hat thinking then requires team members to collect only the data and information at hand. While white hat thinking is in progress, participants put aside proposals. They put aside arguments and individual options. And they are going to review only what information is available or required. Now, this is about the interesting six hat thinking process. Right? This is the technique all about. Now, a well experienced person is going to use a suitable hat to get the job done. You can play the six hat thinking basically as a game, and there are two ways which people normally play. Let's look into the method one. Everyone has a different hat, different variants of hat. One person might wear a red hat, another person might wear a white hat, another person might wear a black hat, another person might wear blue, green, yellow, so on and so forth. So a thinker puts on or takes off one of the hats. A facilitator asks a thinker to put on or off one of the hats. I, as a facilitator, will say, hey, put on the black hat. And you'll have to give me solutions with caution and critical judgment if you wear black hat. And then I'll say, switch to blue hat. And the blue hat is used for control of the brainstorming process. So I, as a facilitator, might direct you on what hat you're going to wear. All thinker is assigned a different hat to wear for a period of time. In a round robin fashion, probably I'll ask person A to wear white hat for the first round of discussion, red hat for the second round of discussion, I'll have him wear a black hat for the third round of discussion, and I'll have him wear a blue hat for the fourth round of discussion, so on and so forth. Right? All thinkers wear hats they do not normally wear. Probably a person does not wear a white hat for significant amount of this particular technique. And then I will say that, hey, you have not wore white hat. So can you please wear a white hat and provide me solutions based on the data and information available with you? And then we have method two. Everyone wears the same hat except the facilitator, right? Facilitator might wear a blue hat, which indicates when a change hat and what hat to wear, right? It indicates when to change hats and what hat to wear. And blue hat, mind you, is used for control of the brainstorming process. So it makes sense if a facilitator wears a blue hat rather than any of the other color hats. All right, this is all about the Bono Six Thinking Hats. Let us move on and discuss about creative thinking and probing. Creative thinking or probing 
is one another technique which helps you identify the best solution now. Probing is considered the child's method. Look at that image wherein there is a child who was wearing a thinking cap here, right? Probing is considered the child's method. Do you know what? Children learn more through probing their parents. Though they most often than not irritate the parents by asking some really thought-provoking questions, right? They learn through probing their parents, family, and friends. It's similar to the auditors who probe a lot to get the requisite information. Journalists use it to remove layers of hidden information. Journalists also use this probing technique. Now, scientists also use the probing technique themselves to think more on the challenges they may face as in how they progress, right? Why do we have this process step, right? This is one kind of question which will help you create, uh, which will help you arrive at the solutions using probing technique. Who else could be doing this? How can we change? So these are all the probing questions. What can we alter? When else can the activity be performed? Can we remove or replace this activity with something else? Can we combine some tasks? Can we apply some learning from other sources? Can we minimize the impact of certain aspects? Can we maximize the impact of certain aspects? Can we rearrange sequence of steps? All these are the bunch of questions which one might want to use as part of creative thinking or the probing technique. Right? Think about that. Think about a small child or your kid asking you probing questions. It would be a lot of thought provoking, my dear friends. Right? Now let us move on to discuss about benchmarking. What are the various types of benchmarking which are available? One is strategic. What do you mean by strategic benchmarking? Strategic benchmarking is used to improve overall performance by examining the long-term strategies and approaches that have enabled great performance to succeed. It involves considering core competencies, developing the new products and services, changing the balance of activities, and improving capabilities for dealing with changes in the background environment. The next type of benchmarking is competitive benchmarking. Similar to Apple and Samsung, right? Competitive benchmarking. If Apple comes up with an interesting feature, Samsung comes up with a similar kind of feature, right? So it's competitive benchmarking always. Competitive benchmarking is used when organizations consider their positions in relation to performance characteristics of vital products and services. Benchmarking partners are drawn from the same segment. The third type of benchmarking is process benchmarking. Process benchmarking is used when the focus is on improving detailed critical processes and operations. Partners are sought from best practice organizations that do similar work or deliver comparable services. And next type of benchmarking is functional benchmarking. This functional benchmarking is used when organizations look to benchmark with partners from different business areas of activity. Right? And they do this in order to find ways of improving the functions or work processes. There are a few more benchmarking concepts. Let us understand those. Internal, external, and international benchmarking. What do you mean by internal benchmarking? Internal benchmarking seeks partners from within the same organization. The main advantages of internal benchmarking are that 
sensitive data or information is more accessible. General data are readily available and less time and resources are needed. That is when you go with internal benchmarking. When do you go with external benchmarking? External benchmarking seeks outside organizations that are known to be best in their field. External benchmarking provides a chance to learn from those who are known to be best in class. Although it is important to remember that not every best practice solution can be adopted by others, right? International benchmarking. And this is the last benchmarking technique which we are going to discuss now in this session. International benchmarking seeks partners from other countries because the best organizations are located in other parts of the world. Or there are too few benchmarking partners within the same country to produce valid results. This is another thing, right? But let us understand more about process benchmarking. Here we go. Steps involved in process benchmarking. First thing is you select the process. Select the process which we want to solve in the process, right? So, uh, sorry, select the problem. Select the problem which we want to solve in the process. Map the process. Map, map the actual present process. Who to benchmark? Check and find out which are the companies or competitors doing same type of business and doing better. Try to identify that. Plan the benchmark. Plan for the benchmark visit in the industries selected by the above process. Analyze and act. This is the last step. Analyze the process of benchmark company and good points in own process and then finalize the targets. Hey, did you know this guy? Uh, uh, this quick bite, guys. A U.S. Air Force Logistics Command who's a rap rapid and reliable parts delivery during the Persian Gulf War was a major success story. Credits its remarkable efficiency to the benchmarking it did with Federal Express. U.S. Internal Revenue Service, they have benchmarked their performance with American Express for billing and Motorola for accounting practices. Calgary Regional Health Authority, right? They have benchmarked their performance with Maryland quality indicators. So organizations of firms or government departments which are in entirely different business started benchmarking with the best firms in the organization. Benchmarking does multiple things for you. It will help you establish a ballpark figure on where you are as of now. Where do you stand as an organization, right? And then it will help you incorporate the best practices followed in the leading organizations. Right? This is all about the process benchmarking. Now let us move on to the next step, which is evaluate the generated solutions. There are again multiple techniques which we are going to discuss. We will discuss in detail about the Pew metrics. Pew metrics can be used to evaluate alternate solutions. Pew metrics gives the team a structured way to make decisions. Then we move on to discuss about Delphi technique. Delphi technique is another way of obtaining group input for ideas and problem solving. It is unlike the nominal group technique. The Delphi does not require face-to-face -face participation. It uses a series of carefully designed questionnaires interspersed with information summaries and feedback from preceding responses. The next thing is multi-voting. Multi-voting narrows a large list of possibilities to a smaller list of the top priorities or to a final selection. 
multi voting is preferable to straight voting because it allows an item that is favored by all but not the top choice of all it is immensely helpful in building the consensus multi voting you it is extremely helpful in arriving at a consensus then we move on to discuss about nominal group technique nominal group technique gathers information by asking individuals to respond to questions posed by the moderator and then asking participants to prioritize the ideas or suggestions of all group members the process prevents the domination of the discussion by a single person it encourages all group members to participate and results in a set of prioritized solutions or recommendations that represent the group's preferences then we move on with fme failure modes and effects analysis this may also be used to analyze risks which new solutions which you have generated might carry with them generated solutions are not free of risks always right and it is prudent to analyze and proactively attempt to reduce or eliminate risks that these solutions carry with them and the last thing is model model or simulate model or simulate solution and carry out trial implementations right you carry on a lot of experiments kind of trial implementations all right so let us do a deep dive on pew matrix and understand what pew matrix is all about here we go with the pew matrix pew matrix was introduced by stuart pew this is also called as a decision matrix method or pew method the pew concept selection is a quantitative technique which is used to rank the multidimensional options of an option set it is frequently used in engineering for making design decisions but it can be used to rank the investment options vendor options product options or any other set of multidimensional entities this is a normal table of the pew matrix expectation importance datum or status quo these are the alternatives and here you have the criteria and few other stuff listed here let us understand this the basic steps of the pew concept selection process are brainstorming alternatives first thing is you try to brainstorm what are the various alternatives here we have alternative 1 2 3 4 and 5 right make one alternative the default often it's the datum or status quo the choice this choice is rated as 0 or s or same s stands for same right you just put down for this for all the various criteria that you have identified primarily brainstorm these criteria also how are you going to evaluate what are you going to evaluate your alternative solutions against right so the criteria and characteristics are important to the customer list them down in rows of this particular sheet begin filling in 1 or plus that means if there is an alternative which is better than your status quo for say criteria 1 put a plus 1 put a 1 or a plus all will work right if you feel that criteria 1 for the status quo and alternative 2 is the same then probably you need to put a zero here or an s that means it's the same as the data more status quo if say alternative 3 is worst in comparison to the data data more status quo with respect to criteria 1 then you're going to put a minus sign or a minus 1 here right 
So based on whether the alternatives one, two, three, four, five against the various criteria, based on whether they are better than the status quo or equivalent or worse, you accordingly put some numbers. If some criteria are more important than others, adjust the weight. If say criteria one is more important than criteria two, three, four, and five, then put some weights against that, which says that criteria one is more important for me in evaluating the solution. If some criteria are more important, then we are going to adjust the weight. If some products are much better than others, adjust the rating weights in the main sheet also. Right? Don't go overboard with it. Not required. Look at what the spreadsheet tells you is the best solution or the best choice among the five alternatives and the status quo. Right? Do you and your group feel good about the decision that you have taken? If so, you're done with the job. If no, redo this entire exercise. Right? Also, find out whether you have all the sets of criteria which you have selected. Is that sufficient or do you need to brainstorm further and come up with more criteria? Right? Are the weights you have assigned close enough? Right? You need to check that as well. Maybe the weights that you have selected is not correct. So you accordingly make the changes. Let me give you a few real-time examples of Pew Matrix. Hey, this is my dream car, Scarpio, right? Most of your websites which sell cars or mobile phones have this Pew Matrix option, right? What do you do? I'm going to select the various variants of this vehicle, Scarpio. All the variants. S2 is a variant, the starting segment, S4, S4+, plus, the mid segments, and the top segment, right? So these are the various alternative options which are available for me, right? Based on what am I going to evaluate? LED eyebrows, this is one criteria. Chrome and front grill, this is second criteria. LED tail lamps, this is the third criteria. Bonnet scoop, which is the fourth criteria. Front and rear bumper, right? This is another criteria. Side cladding, ORVMs and door handles, another criteria. Wheels is another criteria. Say I prefer wheels more than anything else, then I'm going to give a high weightage to wheel. And see, this is the benchmark for me, S4+. Plus. I'm going to... Or I've selected that, or in the brain somewhere, I feel that this is the right option for me. So I'll make this the status quo, and I'll name this as alternate one, alternate two, alternate three, alternate four, and alternate five. Right, and then I proceed with the same process. Most of the smartphone websites, right, this is Blackberry, has an option, right? You can just click on whatever you want to compare, right? These are like the various alternatives which I have. And I'm going to evaluate it based on the display, battery life, based on the size and weight and things like that. Right? And I'm going to select the one which best suits me. This is Pew Matrix. And these are the list of the steps which we have discussed earlier, right? So you can go through this at your own leisure. The same things that we have discussed is listed down here for your reference, basically. All right, let us discuss about the Delphi technique. Who developed the Delphi technique? It was developed by Dalkey and Helmer at the Rand Corporation in the 1950s. It is a widely used and accepted method for achieving convergence of opinion concerning real world knowledge solicited from experts within certain topic areas. Delphi technique is widely used and accepted method 
for gathering data from respondents, right? You gather data from the respondents with the domain of expertise. Now it is used for achieving convergence of opinion. The technique is designed as a group communication process which aims to achieve a convergence of opinion on a specific real world issue. The Delphi process has been used in various fields. It has been used in program planning, needs assessment, policy determination, resource utilization, to develop a full range of alternatives, explore or expose underlying assumptions, as well as correlate the judgments on topic spanning a wide range of disciplines. The Delphi technique is well suited as a method for consensus building by using a series of questionnaires delivered using multiple iterations to collect data from a panel of selected subjects. Subject selection, time frames for conducting and completing a study, the possibility of low response rates, and unintentionally giving feedbacks, right? These are few things which are a word of caution for us. Select the subjects properly. Choose a time frame, right? Beware of the low responses. Beware of unintentional feedback guiding. You should be aware of all that. Fouls in 1978, he has described 10 step process for the Delphi method, basically. First thing is formation. Formation of a Delphi team to undertake a Delphi on a subject. Selection of the expert panels. You need to select the experts. Assume all four are experts here. Development of the first round questionnaire should be done. You need to test the questionnaire for proper wording. Transmit these questionnaires to the panelists or the experts. Once you receive responses from them, analyze those responses. Once you analyze the first responses, prepare for the second round. Right? Transmission of second round questionnaires to the panelists should be done now. Analyze the second round preparation or responses. These steps, preparation, transmission and analysis, may be repeated multiple times to achieve the consensus. And the last thing is preparation and presentation of report. Organizations customize these steps to meet their requirements, as they may have time constraints, and a large number of iterations may not be possible, right? Now, let us understand about multi-voting and nominal group technique, right? What is multi-voting all about? Brainstorming the list of options, right? That's the first thing that we do. What does that mean? Can we understand a little more about this? Oh, yes. First, let us understand what multi-voting means, right? By design, brainstorming generates a long list of ideas, right? A long list of ideas, laundry list of ideas. However, also by design, many of these ideas which were generated using brainstorming may not be realistic or feasible. Right. Now, the multi-voting activity allows a group to narrow their list or options into a manageable size. It may not help the group make a single decision, but it can help the group narrow down a long list of ideas into something which is manageable. It allows all members of the group to be involved in the process, 
and ultimately saves the group a lot of time by allowing them to focus energy on the ideas with the greatest potential. When do you need to use this multi voting? When the group has a long list of possibilities and when they want to narrow it down to a few possibilities for analysis and discussion or when a selection process needs to be made after brainstorming. So first, conduct the brainstorming activity to generate a list of ideas or options. Review the list from the brainstorming activity. Once the green belt or the black belt, they have completed the list, clarify ideas, merge the similar ideas, and make sure everyone understands the options. Please note that at this time, the group is not to discuss the merits of any idea. Pros and cons of ideas should not be discussed now. Just clarify and make sure everyone understands the meaning of each option available. And then you move on, wherein the participants vote for ideas worthy for further discussion. Each participant may vote for as many ideas as they wish to. Voting may be by show of hands or physically going to the board, white board, and marking your choices. Or you might also place dots against your choices. If they so desire, participants may vote for every item. That's their choice. And the next step is identify the items for the next round of voting. Count the votes for each item. Any item receiving votes from half the people who are voting is identified for the next round of voting. For example, if there are 12 people voting, any item receiving at least six votes is included in the second round of discussion. Right? So you vote again. Participants vote again. However, this time they may only cast votes for half the items remaining on the list. In other words, if there are 20 items from the last round that are being voted on, a participant may only vote for 10 items, not more than that. You are going to repeat these things. Participants vote for worthy items. Second round, vote again. You are going to repeat these steps. Right? And participants continue voting and narrowing the options as outlined in step four and five until there is an appropriate number of ideas for the group to analyze as part of the decision making or problem solving process. Generally, groups need to have three to five options for further analysis. And then you start discussing the remaining ideas. At this time, the group engages in discussing the pros and cons of the remaining ideas. Here is where you are going to discuss about the advantages and disadvantages of the ideas. This may be done in small group or a group as a whole. Then you proceed with appropriate actions. At this point, the group goes to the next steps. This might be making a choice of the best option or identifying the top priorities. This is all about your multi-voting. Now, how about NGT? NGT stands for Nominal Group Technique. This is a structure variation of a small group discussion to reach the consensus. NGD gathers information by asking individuals to respond to questions which are posed by moderator and then asking participants to prioritize the ideas suggestions of all group members. The process prevents the domination of the discussion by a single person encourages all group members to participate and results in a set of prioritized solutions or recommendations that represent the group's preferences. 
when should you use this NGT? When should you use that? NGT or nominal group technique is a good method to use to gain group consensus. For example, when various people, your program staff, your stakeholders, community residents, etc., when various people are involved in constructing a logical model, that is when you use NGT, nominal group technique. Here are the four steps which are used in NGT. Step one is generate ideas. The moderator presents the question or problem to the group in written form and reads the question to the group. The moderator directs everyone to write ideas in brief phrases or statements and to work silently and independently. Each person silently generates ideas and writes them down. Then we move on to recording the ideas. Group members engage in a round-robin feedback session to concisely record each idea and they are not going to debate at this point of time. The moderator writes an idea from a group member on a flip chart that is visible to the entire group and proceeds to ask for another idea from the next group member and so on and so forth. There is no need to repeat the ideas here. However, if group members believe that an idea provides a different emphasis or variation, feel free to include it. Proceed recording ideas until all members' ideas have been documented. The idea here is to record all the ideas. Then you discuss the ideas. Each recorded idea is then discussed to determine clarity and importance. For each idea, the moderator asks, are there any questions or comments group members would like to make about the item? This step provides an opportunity for the members to express their understanding of the logic and the relative importance of the item. The creator of the idea need not feel obliged to clarify or explain the item. And the next thing is voting on the ideas. Individuals vote privately to prioritize the ideas. They don't do it publicly, right? Why so? Because if I'm going to vote an idea, and if it is made public, other people might be diverted or I might be diverting the attention of the other participants and they might end up voting for the idea which I'm trying to vote for. The votes are tallied to identify the ideas that are rated highest by the group as a whole. The moderator establishes what criteria are used to prioritize the ideas. And this is how we're going to end this. There are a lot of pros and cons with respect to this. What are the disadvantages of NGT? It requires a lot of preparation, right? What are the advantages? It generates a greater number of ideas than traditional group discussions. It allows the group to prioritize ideas democratically. So these are a few of the advantages of NGT, nominal group technique. All right, next thing is going to be interesting, my dear friends. Design of experiments. DOE. We are going to discuss about the benefits of factors and levels available. DOE, or design of experiments, is a structure and control method used to vary the inputs. Here, inputs are called as factors in order to find the best combination of inputs to deliver the desired output. What does that mean? Let us understand using this image which is provided here. What do you think this equipment here does? It does the curdling process to generate curd and the byproducts. Here is the curd, yummy looking curd, right? Think about any curd manufacturing 
organizations, companies, big giants such as Britannia or Amul. All right? This generation of code process is an ongoing process. How do we ensure that the code is generated, is generated, you know, how do you ensure that traditionally what do we do? In the lukewarm milk, we are going to put a pinch of curd, which will have microbial components, bacteria, and this microbial growth happens when there is lukewarm curd, right? Or uh, lukewarm milk, basically. Now, curdling does not happen when the temperature is cold. Curdling does not happen when the temperature of the milk is hot. Curdling happens when the temperature is optimum, lukewarm, right? What is this optimum temperature at which curdling happens or milk will curdle at a faster pace? Right? That is what your Amul or Britannia would look at, right? Tell me what is the optimum temperature at which milk will curdle, microbial growth is maximum, right? So how do you do that? You do a lot of experiments, right? Basically, you try to put the temperature at maybe so much cold, so much. Maybe you reach the lukewarm. Maybe you increase it further, further, further. And then based on all these experiments, you'll say that milk will curdle a lot at this optimum temperature. That's the interesting part here. When analyzing a process, experiments are often used to evaluate which process inputs have a significant impact on the process output and what the target levels of these inputs should be to achieve a desired level, desired output, desired result. Experiments can be designed in many different ways to collect this information. Design of experiments can be used at the point of greatest leverage to reduce costs by speeding up the process, reducing the late and sudden changes, and reducing time and human resource complexity. We'll understand these things in more detail in the subsequent slides. All right. So, desired experiments are also powerful tools to achieve cost savings by minimizing the process variation, reducing the rework and the need for inspection. Let me show you that. Here we have a list of inputs which get into a process or a system to generate the output. Right? What is the best combination of A, B and C inputs to generate the most optimum output? Right? Here are a few of the learnings from design of experiment. Best optimum settings of input levels. How the inputs affect the output. That is, which inputs, if any, have the most influence on the output. You can probably use sensitivity analysis to do that. What are the parameters used in design of experiments? A, B, C. These are called as inputs. Y is an output here. And these must be expressed in numbers, right? The inputs A, B, and C should be controllable and measurable. We must have a reasonable level of confidence that the input parameters which you have chosen have a significant influence in affecting your output. Hence, you need to have the process knowledge. That's important, right? Here we go. Let us understand design of experiment using this example. I want to come up with a pastry or a piece of cake, right? And I want it to taste well. I want the color to be luring, promising. And consistently, I want to 
manufacturer generator cook this cake with the same taste with the same color these are the examples of characteristics which I want to achieve and this is the output which I want to achieve I want a cake response that is called as in order to come up with this cake I need microwave oven that is the first factor or the first input I need sugar I need flour and I need eggs for each factor these four are called as factors a one sugar flour eggs these are all the factors and each factor has an has a level or a setting right a one temperature say I want to maintain the temperature at 40 degrees in 50 degrees if that is so this factor which is called as a one has two levels level 1 is 40 and level 2 is 50 sugar say I want to test it with one pound of sugar two pounds of sugar and three pounds or ounces of sugar however you want to term that right flour one pound two pound three pounds number of eggs 10 eggs 20 eggs 30 eggs and say I also want to test it with 40 eggs for this X which is a factor or your input variable X you have four levels one two three and four for flour you have three levels this is a factor basically this is a factor X which has three levels one two and three you have sugar which is a factor which again has three levels one two and three a one has two levels 40 and 50 these are the two levels which are available so what are factors these are the process parameters or X's inputs levels these are the possible possible values for the factors for example just assume that temperature has two possible options two possible values 20 degrees and 30 degrees right assume you have only two levels that you have chosen right then this shall be called two levels for the factor temperature and how many outcomes are expected out of that number of levels raised to the power of factors right if I have two levels for each of these four factors then the number of outcomes will be 16 what does that mean so assume I have only two levels for X assume I have only two levels for flour two levels for sugar assume just assume for now right then the number of experiments that you might perform is 2 raised to the power 4 which is 16 so how do you do that with 40 degrees temperature 1 pound of sugar 1 pound of flour in 10x I perform one experiment with 40 degrees 2 pounds of sugar 1 pound of flour 10x I perform another experiment with 50 degrees with 2 kg flour, 1 kg sugar, 20 eggs. I perform another experiment. In that way, I look into all the possible combinations. I perform approximately 16 experiments. And out of all these 16 experiments, which experiment, which combination of inputs is giving me the optimum output, the best output, right? by using the least cost that is achieved or identified using design of experiments yeah that is very important all right let us move on look into the piloting assume that you have identified the most suitable solution right the best solution 
Now is the time that we pilot this best solution which we have identified, right? So how do you do that? What is a pilot basically? A pilot is a test of the proposed solution. And this type of test has the following properties. And what are those properties? It's performed on a small scale. You do not want to fail on a big way, right? Though you know that you have the optimum solution, it's always better for you to first pilot that. If not, um, the failure is going to be extremely costly, right? Pilot is used to evaluate both the solution and the implementation of the solution. Just because I have a solution does not mean it's going to work wonders for me, right? There might be problems with the implementation of the solution as well. The purpose is to make the full-scale implementation more effective. Hence, you first try it on the small scale. And if it is working well, if it does not have any problems, that is when you can go with the full-scale implementation, right? It gives you the data about expected results. And it exposes the issues in the implementation plan. If at all there are any problems, while you implement your solution, this is when you come to know if you do a pilot instead of going the big bang way. The pilot should test both if the process meets our design specifications and the customer expectations. In a hotel check-in process, the design specification, for example, is a target two-minute check-in time, right? This corresponds with the customer's need for quick check-in. So this is just an example. There are a lot of other examples for pilot, right? You probably want to implement at a single location. If your organization is located in multiple locations, you just want to implement at a single location, right? You one, the product or service mockups or models. Small prototype, a working model, right? You probably provide a limited time offers to the customers and see whether the solution that you have brought in in sales and marketing is working well or not. You try to do this early evaluation by end users. Windows 10, right, which is going to come now is a free for a few days, free upgradation for a few days, right? So early evaluation by end user, that is what people do. Beta versions of software are an example of this. Implementation for a select customer group. Instead of maybe providing a sale offer to everyone, I'm going to release it only to a section of customers. And based on that, probably I'll select more. And if it is a success, probably I'll implement that for all the customers, sorry. Walkthroughs, dry runs, or dress rehearsals. Implementation for one work area. Right? If I have multiple departments, probably I'll select to implement the solution for only a single department. Probably I'll release the product only in the test market. These are all the various examples of, you know, piloting, basically. All right, now, why should I pilot? What's the reason, right? Why do I do that? Because I want to improve the solution. I want to understand what are the risks involved in implementing the solution. I want to validate whether the solution is giving me the expected results or not. I want to ensure that there is smooth implementation when I go with full-scale implementation. I want the people to buy in the change. If I'm going to push it the big way, probably there will be a lot of resistance to the change. If I want less resistance, then I'll do a pilot, and this will also ensure that the buy-in happens. People or stakeholders impacted by this change are
are on the line of this particular solution which you intend to perform basically right identify the previously unknown performance problems probably there was no problem when you have come up with the solution but once i implement there might be a lot of additional problems which might come up right so should be wary of all that this is a typical pilot roadmap first you create a pilot plan you ensure that there is a strong leadership support for you you communicate the plans to key stakeholders you train the pilot group if you implement the pilot then after implementation of the pilot you collect and analyze the feedback then you try to diagnose the gap and revise the solutions and also you implement the solution so these are the eight steps which you traditionally follow for a pilot basically when should a pilot you pilot when you need to confirm the expected results and practicality of the solution is it practically possible if yes then what are the results if you want to reduce the risk of failure if you're going to implement a big way full-scale implementation what if it fails if you are implementing on a small scale if it's going to fail the cost of failure is going to be less in comparison to full-scale implementation failure right the scope of the change is large if you implement the big way and in order to revert it's going to be extremely difficult implementing the change will be costly right changes would have far-reaching unforeseen consequences right so that's about that and then we have pre-pilot and post-pilot before piloting a solution what should i do post piloting the solution what do i do right let us look into pre-pilot ensure that all elements of the design are complete ensure that all the design elements are well integrated and interfaces between different parts of the design are tight enough ensure that pre-pilot review is needed to identify the possible failure points and areas of vulnerability to be tested in the pilot Pre-pilot is needed to review the predictability, to review predicted design capability. Pre-pilot review is needed to review the pilot and the implementation plans. Extremely important. Post that, you implement the pilot. You're going to pilot your solution. And then you also look into the post-pilot. The pilot plan should be designed to include steps to analyze the reasons. Root causes of performance gaps may need to be analyzed. Analyze the root causes. Even a small change in a business process can affect many other processes. During a pilot, the team may need to double check for this ripple effect. You need to check for the impact on other processes. Make sure the new design has not somehow caused problems for your internal supplier and customer process. Ensure. People working in such support areas as planning, customer service operations, and quality control need to know that you're doing things differently so they can adjust their work when necessary. So communicate with all the parties which might be impacted with your change. FMA can be used to anticipate the potential problems, right? Due to the impact on other processes and people. And we can often take countermeasures to reduce or eliminate the risks. That's the important part. Finally, we complete the pilot review. 
once the pilot is complete you will have to review that once all the pilot data has been collected and the results verified the team can determine the next steps towards solution implementation only and only after an objective and comprehensive assessment of the pilot can responsible next step decisions be made some questions few of the questions a team should ask upon the completion of a pilot to help guide them towards identification of the proper next steps are follows right did pilot yield you the anticipated results was a plan for conducting the pilot effective what improvement can we make to the solution can the solution be implemented as is right should it be can the solution remain in place at the pilot location what lessons learned and best practices can we apply during solution implementation right and did the solution achieve the required design goals or not so these are few steps which you need to check after the pilot is implemented now let us look into the key outputs of the improve phase we have come to the end of the improve phase the key output is the selected solution right however we have also generated a list of potential solutions and then we have selected the solution we have optimized the solution settings we have looked into fmea to identify what are the risks associated with the selected solution we have checked the impact of the selected solution and the benefits and the new pilot is required improve phase in a nutshell we have generated alternate solutions to control the inputs using these techniques primarily brainstorming round robin fashion benchmarking creative thinking or probing process mapping right these are a few of the tools and techniques which we have used to generate alternative solutions then we have evaluated the alternative solutions to identify the optimum solution we have used pew matrix which may be used to compare alternative solutions we have used fmea failure mode effects analysis to analyze the risks of the solution we have built consensus on alternative solutions right using delphi we try to build consensus using multi voting and ngt nominal group technique we have tried to build a consensus finally we have selected the solution which we want to pilot and if the pilot is successful we do a full scale implementation post the full scale implementation performance of your output is reevaluated to check whether significant improvement has taken place or not all right my dear friends we have come to an end of improve phase i hope you have enjoyed the session we are looking forward for you to go through the control phase and there are a lot of interesting examples which are awaiting you in the control phase see you there bye for now thank you so much for listening to this session